And our Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. We're gathered to you and not to any man. Make this time an experience of transformation for everyone. Let your face shine upon us. Let your beauty be upon us here. Raise men here that will transform our world, starting from their homes. We thank you, our Father. Holy Spirit, we're conscious of your presence in this place this morning. Make this all about you. Speak through every speaker. Make every session impactful. And let us go bless. Not just challenged, but transformed. That your name may be glorified through each and every one of us. We thank you, our Father. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Somebody say, believe in amen. amen. Please put your hands together as you have your seat. All right, before I say anything, the first thing I'd love to say is that, uh, men, you need to look around and just look at somebody and tell them and challenge them. Uh, you know, just tell them it's time for us to mobilize. Yeah. Because I know that uh, just amongst those of us here, we have a circle of influence, especially amongst men, that are quite wide. And I know those of us that are here this morning, we definitely have uh, something in our heart that is yearning. Uh, that there are, there are things going on in our world today. And uh, men, we are becoming the, the story. We are no longer shaping the narrative. We are the story. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. A lot of women walk up to me and say, PG, what are you doing about the men? What are you doing about the men? What are you doing about the young men? What are you doing about, you know, husbands? Because the stories are not good. The stories are not good. And then when we say men come together, it's always a struggle. I've made up my mind, whether through large gatherings, small gatherings, one-on-one, -on -one, meeting with single men, with you know, married men, I'm just going to continue. And I, I, I hope you join me in that crusade. <laughs> praise God. I said praise God. Hallelujah. I haven't said that, I would love to appreciate our guest speakers uh, who are here today to be a blessing. Uh, I, I want to... Uh, appreciate Dr. Victor Mbanisi for making our time to be here today. Uh, we thank you very much, sir, for coming. Uh, and also, Pastor Femi Atoebi, can we please put our hands together for Pastor Femi uh, for being here today. Uh, the two men that we have in the house today are men that I've known for, for quite a while. Um, I've had the privilege of interacting with uh, Dr. Mbanisi's family uh, when I was um, at Daystar, uh, uh, his, his kids were my prodigies, yeah, let me put it that way. <laughs> One of them worked with me in the office. Uh, they went through our training program. I mean, all the, almost every member of your family have been in trainings that I've, I've taken before, and we've learned so much from, from him, and we, we believe that today God will use him to impact us. And by the way, it's also important for me to say that uh, my first message from the Bible, I preached it in Pastor Femi's living room. Yeah. <laughs> he, he probably doesn't know that. He had an idea, he had an idea but I think it's, it's okay for me to now say it, not just uh, in a private discussion, but uh, in public. Uh, the address, I cannot forget, number 60 of Shifolari Street. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, uh, <laughs> I think that's Paco Bus Stop at Akoka. Yeah. Uh, I hope you still remember, sir. <laughs> This, 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 what I just said now, I think must have happened in 1992, yeah. Yeah, 1992. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was once house fellowship leader in his house. Yeah. And he was one of our ministers in church and administrator of the church. That was Rema Chapu Yaba uh, in the early days of Rema Chapu in Lagos. And God has used him tremendously from those days of little beginnings uh, to the days of national prominence and uh, also being one of the most leaders in the Christian Church of God, arguably the largest congregation or largest denomination in Africa. Uh, and God has used him also tremendously in the legal profession in this country. He's a man of wisdom and a man of strength. We're glad to have him here. Can we appreciate two of our guests one more time? Thank you, sirs. Praise God. I'm sharing the brevity of the time that I have uh, because I will, I, you know, 
like you know, Jesus said, the poor you always have with you, but I'm not poor, but you always have me with you. <laughs> you always have me with you, so I, I don't want to take all, all the time. The brevity of the time that I have, I'm sharing on what I've tied to no pain, no gain. Look at your neighbor for me and tell your neighbor, no pain, no gain. Talking about being unstoppable, and I've decided to just take a corner of it and speak on that this morning. I'm going to speak a lot from, uh, a bit from the scriptures and a lot also from my personal experience, um, notwithstanding you know, how, how, how short of an experience I've had has been uh, very packed. Let me put it that way. Very packed. Very packed. Uh, no pain, no gain. I want to speak today about perspectives to pain and how uh, for us as men, we must understand that we, we have to give before we get and that we, we can't afford to keep running away from pain. Let me start out by saying that being unstoppable starts with having a God-given vision. It starts with having a God-given vision. Being unstoppable starts with having a God-given vision. That's where it starts from. So as a man, I must have a God-given vision for my life, for my family, then for my vocational life, whether it's career or business. Many people have a vision for their vocational life, but they don't have a vision for their family. Many people have a vision for their family, for their vocational life, but they don't have a sense of personal vision, which gives you a sense of personal leadership. For instance, a man has to decide, I don't want to end up accidentally I need to make a decision that I want to go to heaven. Yeah. If you go to Ikoi prison right now, more than 70% of the people there, they did not have a plan to be in prison. It was just that they didn't have a plan to be somewhere else. <laughs> I hope you understand what I'm saying. That's what happens when you take statistics in the prisons. Most of the people there, they, they, they didn't set out wanting to go to prison. But the truth also is that they did not set out not wanting to be in prison. Yeah. Because if you tell yourself, I don't ever want to get into prison in my lifetime, that's, that's, that's like a direction of vision. It guides you from making decisions that can hang you up in prison, in jail. So we started um, a construction here this uh, past week, on, on, on Monday, Tuesday. And when I got in here, I walked around, they started cordoning and removing the old tent that was there at the back. You know, on Sunday I announced that we're putting up a five-story uh, structure there for some extensions and offices and all that. And that construction started. And when I walked around, I did a mental assessment of what was going on and a quick safety audit. And I realized that, I mean, from my training as an engineer, safety is very important to me. I'm, I'm well-trained as an engineer. Trained in Nigeria, but well-trained. <laughs> yeah, well trained yeah. as an engineer. So when I came in, I didn't wear the hat of a pastor. I wore the hat of an engineer. And I walked around, looked at you know, how the site layout, the cordoning and all that. I did a, a safety audit and I said, this place is not safe. So I called the facility manager. And one thing I told him, I was like, I don't want to go to jail. <laughs> I said, do you want to go to jail? He said, no. <laughs> you have to reconfigure. I mean, we have to do this safety audit ourselves. We don't need somebody to come here and audit us, and then we'll, we'll get into trouble. If you don't live your life like that, you end up where you did not want to end up. That's what happens. I'm sure when I told the guy, I don't want to go to jail, do you want to? He was like, ah, Pastor, what is it? Is it not just sight? It's not just sight. Because if anything goes wrong here, if we have an emergency here, and something bad happens, you may assume that uh, Nigeria is not that hard, but we need to prepare for the real Nigeria that we want. Yeah. Where anybody can go to jail. <laughs> I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Because people think that you can rig your way through everything, fine. But in the new Nigeria, people who need to go to jail will go to jail. Yeah. That's our prayer. Yeah. Say a good amen to that. Because until that starts to happen, we can have a better country. Yeah. We can have a better country. So, back to what I was saying. 
In life, you set your sail for success. If you're used to sailing, you know, if you know a little about sailing, when you're on the high sea, when you set your sail in a direction that you want to go, all the forces available on the high sea, including the wind, will carry you in the right direction. The sail, you know, I mean, that thing that they rig up with, it, they, they turn it based on the direction that they want to go after you have studied the wind. Then you don't have to do anything serious again. The wind then starts to blow you in the right direction. When you start out with a sense of vision, what you are doing is that you are setting a sail. And you must set a sail for personal success, for family success, for vocational success, and for spiritual success. If I, if I would just limit it at that level. You know, the only issue is this. The moment you set your sail, the moment you, you, you set a vision, either for your family, for your vocational life, for your spiritual life, something starts to happen. And that's that adversity will start to locate you. Pain we seek to locate you because pain is a stopper. Pain is a limiter. It limits expression. It limits how far we can go. So if we want to go far, like I said, we have to start with a sense of vision. But the only issue is that vision attracts adversity. Vision ad attracts pain. So the fact that your vision is from God does not mean that there won't be obstacles. A young lady in the scriptures, by the name of Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, unsolicited, got a divine visitation. And the angel said, you're going to have a child. And that child will be the only one of God. I mean, ordinarily, this woman should start dancing that I've, I've hammered. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. That breakthrough has come. If God said, I want to deposit something in your house, it, it, I mean, can you imagine that uh, uh, the richest man in Africa calls you and say, um, you're a good person. I want you to mentor my son, and he's going to be staying in your house. And, um, you know, the first thing that will come to your mind is that, ah, that means you'll give us another house now, because this house, <laughs> this house is too small. Well, and since you, you have all the means, just give us another house. You know, maybe you put a car with it, because your son cannot be riding my car with me. You know, that's if you have a car. If you don't have a car, you say, I, I, I don't have a car. Uh, you know, that, that's the kind of sense that I thought Mary would have. You know, that, look, this is, this is going to be great. I have the first begotten of the Father in my house. That means all the grace in this world, the anointing and, and the benevolent grace of God is going to be resident in my house. But, you know, contrary to that, you know what happened? It was running from pillar to post. The moment the Son of God was located in our house, <laughs> the king came after her. A decree was issued. I don't know if you are getting what I'm saying. Can you carry a son of promise and still have to run from pillar to post? Run to, 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 you know, to Egypt, to Nazareth, to everywhere just because something you, you, you're not carrying something for God. That's the mistake we make a lot of the time. People think that if God has given you a vision, if there's a God-given vision, it, it's going to be a walk in the park. It's just going to be a bed of roses. You're just, just going to, because you have heard God. <laughs> Sometimes you don't, we don't realize that when you heard God, the, the, the trouble just started. Yeah. Because the moment you hear God, you forget that the devil knows that God has spoken to somebody. And the next thing he wants to do is to stop that thing from coming to pass. The Bible says, you see that speak, that, 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 you know, that speak, uh, and it comes to pass, or how did you put it? He said, uh, you, uh, yeah. They, they, there's something about God's word that will not return unto him void. And the devil knows that. But the devil is a stubborn goat. The truth is clear, but it's very stubborn. 
and he want to do his best to make sure that if there's any window at all, you know, any, like they say in law, any lacuna, he will exploit to the last. Pastor Femi is looking at me. <laughs> to, <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 I'm using those languages deliberately because we have a senior advocate in the house. <laughs> I just want to harass him a bit. <laughs> you know, the devil loves to just look through everything and look for the gaps because he knows that he doesn't have anything but those gaps. That's why the Bible says we should not be ignorant of the devices of the devil. He has no power over us. He only has devices. Wiles, the Bible calls, call, call, calls them. That's what the devil is always looking at. So, whenever there's a God-given vision, the devil shows up. The devil shows up. So, don't accept the culture that every adversity can stop you. I've made up my mind that adversity will not stop me. Can you hear me tell your neighbor, say, adversity will not stop me? Yeah. In our culture today, any sense of pain or little setback can be fatal. So I drive through the city of Lagos and I see people. There's a guy that I had to speak to at the next intersection here who begs there. He had his ham. Something happened to his hand. He has his two hands, but they're a little bent like this. So he would take off his shirt. I think it would be illegal for me to show his picture. <laughs> I don't have it anyway. I didn't take his picture. But I know many of us here know him, especially if you come around here a lot. Yeah. One day I called him. I said, you know what? If it's about money, I have money to give you. But I'm not sure you want to leave this place. I said, from today, I'm not going to give you money again. Because when I drive past, I give them money. I said, you, I'm not going to give you money again. Because the way you are, nothing stops you from making a living and being the best that you can be, but you've just chosen to be on the road. Yeah. Just because your hands are bent like that, but those hands, you are still using them to, to lift the basket which you are collecting something. And you can see, you can talk, you can walk, for crying out loud. It's a bad culture that we have when we don't speak out and challenge such people. I know what I'm saying now is not probably what you, what you expect a pastor to say, you know, we should continue to do arms giving. But you know there's toxic charity, and that's what is pulling Africa backward. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Charitable deeds that, 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 that don't change anything. Yeah. You know, some of the things we do in the name of being charitable, are things that, I mean, I've, this year I've had the opportunity of different platforms in South Africa and different places to share what I'm talking about right now. The fact that even the church, we have to be more organized in our charitable or philanthropic effort to lift people out of real poverty. You can do hams giving. All those kind of things are meant for, uh, uh, how do I put it now? When there's emergency situation, when there's calamity, yeah, there's flooding or fire, then give people clothes, give them, you know. But you, there's no fire, there's no calamity. Somebody needs to be taught how to walk. Yeah. Somebody needs to be given skills. Somebody needs to be given a head start. Somebody needs to be chased away from something and say, no, you can't stay here. Are you still here today? So we can't accept that culture that every adversary can stop you. Not every adversary can stop you. So paralysis should not stop someone. Loss of eyesight, should, I mean, there are people who don't have their sight again and they can buy a thousand people with eyesight. Yeah. Yeah. But we over magnify and over glorify adversity and hardship. The truth is that if you are alive, you can still try. Yeah. Proverbs 24 and verse number 10 says, If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. 
There's a particular translation that I love so much. I don't know whether it's living Bible translation. It says, if you fail to perform under pressure, you are a poor specimen. Yeah. Poor specimen. And there's too many poor specimens around today as men. You know, I have two daughters. Little wonder God is pushing me to talk to men. Because we will meet giants, we will meet Goliath. Are they going to stop us? That's the issue. And the only way we will say that they, can't, they won't stop us is when we become someone who has the emotional fortitude, the spiritual fortitude, the physical fortitude to be able to withstand adversity and say, I'm going to go further. I'm going to go faster. I'm going to do better. Nothing is going to stop me. Praise God. So the news flash this morning is that God giving dreams will bring some adversity or pain. Yeah. God giving dreams will bring some adversity or pain or pain. If there's anyone here this morning, anyone watching online, anyone who will partake of this message after now, who is praying to God, enlarge my territory. Give me new dreams, new vision, you know, and all that. All you are saying is that, Lord, I'm ready for greater challenges because I'm not going to quit. Yeah. I'm ready for greater challenges because I'm not going to quit. That's what you are saying. Add there to that prayer. No, you are not saying it like that. But I can tell you for free. I can tell you for free. Every year when I pray uh, about my life, my family, the ministry, you know, and all that, I've come to terms with the fact that with every new direction, new vision that God will bring will be one kind of adversity or the other that I need to surmount, that I need to cope with, that I need to, you know, just look straight and, and do something about. Glory be to Jesus. It's like the case of Peter in, in, in Matthew 14. We say that, uh, <laughs> I think it was John Otberg, the great writer, that said, there's a fundamental truth. And you see, when you see the way he wrote it in his book, there's a fundamental truth, universal truth. <laughs> you think it's one big thing. And, and he put it this way. He said, to walk on water, you have to step out of the boat. Yeah. So, many people will rather remain in their boat and still be walking on water. That is pipe dream. Yeah, that's not the real vision. Every vision, we attract some challenges, some adversity, and we need to be able to measure up to it. So the measure of your strength is commensurate to the pain that you can withstand. Yeah. How do we measure strength? It's pain. Pain. The, our threshold for pain is a measure of our strength. Our threshold for pain. Our threshold for pain. The lack of enough threshold for pain is what is leading to divorces, for instance. Many people are divorced today because they've said, I've taken it this far, I can't take it any longer. You know, I'm working out. The same reason why sometimes people pack up businesses. I've taken it this far, I can't take it any longer. I've reached my breaking point, I'm working out. Can you let me tap your neighbor today and ask your neighbor, what's your threshold for pain? Yeah. And somebody may also be asking me, how do you measure threshold for pain? <laughs> it's by experiencing the pain. <laughs> yeah, because you kind of measure, it's like saying, how do you measure what you can carry in terms of weight? You have to carry it. Am I saying the truth? How many people go to gym here? Can I say a show of hand? Yeah. When you go to the gym and you want to know, <laughs> let me not go there. I don't want to be distracted, but it just came to my mind. I needed to say it. About three or four years ago, my wife and I were on holiday in the U.S. And the day before we left, we went through, my, it was my brother-in-law's graduation. He was graduating his MBA, my wife's younger brother, in North Carolina. So we went to North Carolina to see him and to attend his graduation. And he, you know, the boy is very big with muscles and all that. And he trains at one YMCA uh, gym. And he's also a trainer there. So he took us there in the morning. Say, oh, PG, let's go, let's go to the gym. You know, PG, let's go to the gym. So we went to the gym. And said, we joined a class. Can I tell you the truth? That class, there were 
women there in their mid 50s and mid 60s, old women. So it's like, Ayo, why are you bring me to a class of old women and all that? I said, don't worry, just, let's just join. It's a 45 minutes class. We we'll do all the aerobics and carry all the stuff together. And so th there was an instructor, and we did all that. And in my mind, when they say, okay, so carry this uh, 10 kg, one here, one there, and do this, hey, hey, and they're playing music, hey, 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 hey. you know, because all those old women were doing it. I, I was telling myself, why would I do it? <laughs> so I, 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 I was picking all those things and I was doing it, you know, and I was dancing and do, you know the truth? We managed to finish. But by the time we got home, I sat down for maybe like 20 minutes and I just wanted to stand up. <laughs> I didn't do anything, I just wanted to stand up. And there was a problem standing up. <laughs> but you see, the one that I can never forget in my life was the fact that by the next day when we were going to catch our flight to come back to Lagos, I told my wife, if I survive this flight, <laughs> you know why? To move my hand was a problem. As in, I needed to pray to be able to move my hand. <laughs> Every part of my body was paining me. And I was going to be in a, <laughs> in a 12 hour flight or so from Atlanta to Lagos, Delta. And I was like, if I survive this flight, then God can do anything. <laughs> God does miracles. I'm telling you, it was, it was a bad experience. So, how do you measure <laughs> your threshold for pain? You have to carry something. We have too many men who are carrying nothing. Too many. Carrying nothing. The women are frustrated because you are not carrying anything. And we have to tell ourselves the whole truth. Men were built for carrying stuff. If you even look at our physique, that's why it's different from a woman's physique. You are built for carriage. Look at your shoulder, very broad. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I, it, it may be funny, but I, I'm, I'm just trying to let us know something. When you put a man and a woman side by side, even if you've never met a man and a woman before, a, a well-built man and you know, a built woman, or just a woman, the way a woman should be, something will tell you that this one is a carrier. This one is a supporter. Am I saying the truth? Yeah. W women are not necessarily built to carry stuff like that. And a lot of our women are carrying things physically, carrying things financially, carrying things emotionally, even carrying us spiritually. That's really bad. By the time a woman has to carry you in all those four dimensions, that woman may not live long. I'm telling you the truth. And the, the woman will live in frustration. That's, that, that's part of why we're here. We need to do something about that. We need to understand that God wants us to, you know, take our responsibility, step up, you know, to the plate, and do something differently. Can you hear me ask your neighbor again, what is your threshold for pain? So be it emotional, vocational, financial, physical, or spiritual pain, we need to be able to take it up a notch higher. A notch higher. That's, that's the kind of thing I want to do every year. I'm trusting God that every year of my life, my threshold for pain will go a little higher. A little higher. The kind of things that someone did to me last year, and I freaked out, if you, if you, if you uh, did the same thing this year, I should be able to smile. Because now it's not as painful as it used to be. A man is not growing emotionally, and your treasure for emotional pain is not growing, it's not going up, if what you fought your wife about, to the point that you almost threw a point, or you threw a point last year, now you are still fighting about it. If what somebody said last year, and moved you to tears, is still moving you to tears right now, you need the Holy Ghost. Because that's, that's how we, we have to take our treasure for pain to the next level. All the time. Because life will throw bigger challenges at us. When you look at Jesus, one of the things that characterized his person, one of the messianic prophecies about Jesus was Isaiah 53. 
Isaiah 53, when you, look, when you read uh, verse 3, the, almost the whole of Isaiah 53 is a messianic prophecy about Jesus. Put Isaiah 53 verse 3 on, on the screen for me. And let's see how he was dis, dis, described. The Bible says he is despised and rejected by men. This was, Isaiah was prophesying about Jesus Christ here. And we don't want to face any rejection. We don't want to be despised at all. But what, what's the, what, what, what was the way to the victory that we enjoy today? You know the reason why death could not hold him? Why the, the grave opened up for him? Because he went through this route. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. I mean, if this looks like your, go back there. If that looks like your story in your home right now, why do you think that you are alone? This is the, the pictorial image of our Savior. So if you are the Savior of your home and you were despised and rejected, it's just after the order of Jesus Christ. Is somebody following me this morning? It's, it's nothing out of this world, that's what I'm saying. Because somebody, you want to break a bottle on somebody's head just because of this. He was reviled and he did not revile back. That's what the scripture says. If we truly want to be like Jesus, this is how to be like Jesus. Because a man of sorrow acquainted with grief. We hid ourselves, uh, we, we hid as it were, our faces from him, and he was despised and we did not esteem him. Uh, verse 4. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrow, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. You get into some situation where you even feel that maybe it's God that is doing all these things to me. That's what the scripture says here. It was orchestrated for a greater purpose. Yeah. Orchestrated for a greater purpose. And you know the, the story of the great apostle Paul after the order of Christ? If you read this Messianic prophecy and then you read 2 Corinthians chapter 4 from verse 7, then you will know that Paul was just after the order of Christ. Because in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7, Paul said, we have this treasure in earthen vessel that the excellence of power may be of God and not of us. Look at the next verse. We are at press on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in our bodies the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ that the life of Jesus may also be manifest in our body. Paul said, all these things we are doing is after the order of Christ. That the life of Jesus may manifest in our body. That the same, the things that Christ went through, I'm willing to go through them. So I can be a man like him. Glory be to Jesus. As I start to tie this all up, I have less than 10 minutes, you know, more. Uh, I want to give a perspective. There are different kinds of pain. Last summer, the Holy Spirit was taking me through this. I think this is the first time I'm sharing on it. Different kinds of pain. You know, the, the, what we have normally is that when you see pain, run. That's the mantra of some people. Yeah, when you see pain, just run. Anything that's painful, bail. If you see anything painful, escape. That's the way we have been wired. Anytime you see pain, escape. Now, let's go through the types of pain and you'll see the reason why we cannot ex ex escape from every pain. One, bad pains. Bad pains. As soon as Zion travails, she brought forth. It's like, will I take to the place of bath and not cause to bring forth? That was God asking the question in the book of Isaiah. He said, as soon as tra Zion travailed, she brought forth. There's bath pain. You cannot bath anything that has life, continuous life, and sustainable life in it in this world, and it will not be painful. After the order of giving birth to a child. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. That's God's divine order. If you want to bath a great vision, you want to bath a great business, you want to bath something new, it comes with its attendant pain. It's not only biologically, but in every other area of life. Bad thing, bad thing, bad thing will come with its own pain. Is there somebody here who's about to bat something? 
Watch out for the pain that will come with it and trust God to give you strength to go through that pain. So there's back pains. There's also the pain of necessary endings because that's the pain that bats new beginnings. Many people want new beginnings, but they don't want to uh, encounter the pain of necessary ending. These are pains that you cannot run away from. That's what I'm saying. I'm going to tell you the kind of pain to run away from. But these are pains that we cannot run away from. Bad pains you can't run away from. It. Pain of necessary ending. Because necessary endings precede new beginnings. Remember not the former things. I will do a new thing. That's what the scripture says. You cannot have a new thing without forgetting the former things. And to, to break away from former things, there's a pain of necessary ending. When I had to say no to my old chick, who is always available, when I had to say no to that, you know, friend with benefit, because there are many men who always have option B. You know, if my wife is not performing at home, option B. Yeah. Whether it's food, sex, or affirmation. Always have option B. You, you have a place where you derive your sense of affirmation from. Uh, somebody you go to and they tell you, ah, handsome man. Hey, uh, Dangote of Nigeria. You know, and all that. They'll be telling you all kinds of things that you want to hear. Yeah. Option B for affirmation. Option B sometimes even for food. We always have option B. Option B for sex. But what we don't know is that for you to have, I mean to enter into real new beginnings that God has for you, you must be willing to suffer the pain of necessary endings. Some things must end for certain things to start. Somebody may be listening to me right now, I say this to you prophetically, the new things that God wants to do in your life, you must cooperate with God to end certain things and bury them completely. That's the only way. That you can get into that new season. And there's pain that comes with it. Because it's not easy to let go of some things. Also the pain of separation. Yeah. Because there are seasons of our lives where God wants to separate you. And put it in a corner. Moses was in the backside of nowhere for a while. Until the burning bush experience. Can you suffer the pain of separation? Sometimes God wants to take you into a place that looks like obscurity. Joseph was separated from his family. There's an attendant pain that comes with that. Just being just taken to a place where you just lack relevance and you're just there and forgotten there. Seemingly forgotten, but God has not forgotten you. It's just a face. And there's pain of separation that you need to be able to deal with. Also, there are pains that heal. Healing pains, I call them. Pains that heal. Sometimes your route to healing is pain. <laughs> I got to know that as a young boy. When they say, come and take injection, you will feel better. <laughs> but you know the injection <laughs> is going to bring some pain. I usually will ask the question, can I take tablet? They say, if you really want to feel better, let's inject you. I don't like injection. I'm saying it openly. I, I don't know. Some people, they can take six. Pa, 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 and be going on me. One, you will chase me to give me one. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when I was in high school. <laughs> I was at government college, but I went to UCH. They said there was a big Lions Club or something. We were having one charitable stuff to do uh, genotype for all secondary school students. When we got there, and I realized that they would have to take our blood. I don't like needle. I said, I'm not doing it. They said, we well, brought you in the school bus from all this. You said, no, you have to do it by force. I said, it's not by force. <laughs> what they didn't understand. And they asked me, do you have a genotype card? I said, no. But if there's any other way for you to get my blood, apart from this, we'll do it. <laughs> That's, I mean, I've overcome that now. But back in the day, that was how bad it was. I see needle, I run. But the truth is that without that pain sometimes of being injected, and that's how life is. There are pains that will lead to healing. When I used to play football and I will sprain my ankle or something and I will get home and my mom will say, come, walk, let's see. And then you walk because you are trying to dodge it. And then she will say, come, boil water, boil water. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you tell my sister, boil water, boil water. And bring, bring, and then you say, sit down here, sit down here, bring that leg. 
and put hot water. But you know after that you wake up the following morning and the leg feels better. Yeah. Many of us don't want to encounter any pain that will bring healing. And it's a problem. You can't run away from pains that heal. Let me tell you one kind of pain that heals is a pain of straight talk. Truth. Many people keep deflecting the truth. Truth we hurt initially, but we heal you permanently. <laughs> Truth may hurt you temporarily, but it will heal you permanently. And many people don't like the truth. And we keep running away. We keep running away from hearing the truth. There's also growth pains. Growth pains. Growth pains. For some, for us to see growth, sometimes it's painful. Yeah. So there's growth pains. And many people are dodging pain that will lead to growth. The moment you dodge pain that will lead to growth, you're stagnated on the same spot. Stagnated on the same spot. And the last one is destructive pains. That's the one we should run away from. Destructive pains. That's the one we should run away from. Like pain of regret, pain of unfor unforgiveness. Those are the kind of pains we should run away from. And, and ask the Holy Spirit to help us. It's like somebody is coming now to hit you with something. You can see it from afar. You can run away from that. Yeah. But for somebody to sit you down and tell you the truth, it emotionally is like hitting you too. But it's going to heal you. But we're accustomed to running away from all kinds of pains. And we shouldn't. We shouldn't. We shouldn't. Glory be to Jesus. So pain will bring newness, will bring growth, Breakthroughs to straighten us out sometimes because pain is an instructor. A man who does not want to conquer pain is a man who doesn't want to prosper. Yeah. All men are called to lead, and especially at home. We are all called to lead. And leadership, all leadership is a magnet for pain. That's my experience in leadership. Leadership is a magnet for pain. As a man, if you accept that you are called to lead in your home, lead at work, lead in church, lead in different areas of life, there's no leadership without pain. Yeah. Just call to lead a woman already appoints you as a man of pain, <laughs> acquainted with grief, <laughs> according to <laughs> Isaiah 53, <laughs> verse 3. Yeah. Just that you are called to lead a home. You, you have going to experience certain level of grief, of pain, and you must come to terms with that after the order of Jesus Christ. So, in rounding up, leaders get, I mean, I said all, leaders, all leadership is a magnet for pain, and leaders get uh, flack for decision making, whether good or bad, and we get flack for bad decisions. So, you take a bad decision in your home and you get uh, a flack for that, don't despair. It's just part of leadership. Yeah. We get criticized for good decisions because we have changed the status quo. Because good decisions sometimes will change the status quo. And some people love status quo. So you are going to get criticized for bad decision, for good decision, whatever decision. Leaders carry people's burdens and share their pain. And then we get some pain out of that. <laughs> If you want to be a true man that God has made you to be, you have to be willing to lead. And when you lead, you carry people's burdens and you share their pain. We're exposed to betrayers, envy, and even, you know, uh, exhaustion. That's, that's, that's what, what we're exposed to. That's what we're exposed to. When we're praying towards the end, I'm going to lead us to pray. Not now, but towards the end, I'll come back to lead us to pray. We're going to pray. Because I believe that people here today, God wants to restore you, restore your strength. Some people are living here with a new operating system. Amen. Yeah. Some people are receiving an upgrade. Amen. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. You have been operating something 8.0, you are going to 10.0. Yeah. See, at 10.0, the pain that you couldn't handle at 8.0, you undo it. That's what it means. That's what I believe God is doing here today for someone here. 
Glory be to Jesus. I said, glory be to Jesus. So my encouragement today is that you should be strong, be unstoppable. Make up your mind. Pain is not going to stop me. Adversity is not going to stop me. Because God with you makes you unconquerable. That's what God with us means. Emmanuel, God with us. It makes us unconquerable. We are more than conquerors in Christ. So all the time we tell the devil, bring it on, bring it on, bring it on, because the greater one is on our inside. Is it at work, at home, in your finances, wherever the adversity is right now, the greater one is on your inside. That pain will not break you. It will make you a better person. Lift your two hands to Jesus and just bless him. Just bless him. Just bless him. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we bless your name. Lord, we bless your name. Lord, we bless your name. Father, we thank you. The same way death could not stop Jesus Christ. The grave couldn't hold him back. Today, I declare in the name of Jesus Christ, whatever grave, whatever handicap, emotional, physical, whatever it may be, it will not be able to stop you. In the name of Jesus. I want you to declare after me today, say I'm unstoppable. I cannot be limited. Say the God of the universe dwells in me. It gives me strength. It gives me grace to fulfill my dreams, to lead my home, and to change the world. So I'm prepared to face adversity. Say I'm built to bring down Goliath after the order of David. Say I'm a strong man. I'm a man of purpose. I'm a man of strength. And I'm a man of honor. Say I will not be bring this honor or disrepute to my family and to the body of Christ. Say I shine with Christ. I rule and reign in this world after the order of Christ. In Jesus precious name. If you're blessed today, you put your hands together, celebrate Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. All right, before we, we, we take uh, uh, the next session, I'm going to bring up the Elevation Priest of Praise for a time of ministration. Uh, and uh, this promises to be a great time. I want us to make it participatory. Um, let's tear ourselves a bit as we enjoyed this this special administration. Can you put your hands together and receive with me the elevation, praise of praise as a leader. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of us knows that Jesus loves us? He loves us with an everlasting love. He knew you. Be, he loved you even before he formed you because he knew you and he's loved you. He loves you recklessly. For I spoke a word, you were singing over me. Reckless love of God, oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you can yourself away all oh, the overwhelming never ending reckless love of God yeah. I thank you for your love Jesus thank you for the love that you've shown unto us oh God when I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so good to me, oh God. You have been so, so kind to me. When I felt, when I felt that I wasn't worth anything.
out to me Let no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear it out Coming out to me Now I just want you to join me and say There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming out to me There's no wall you won't kick down Wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear it out Coming out to me There's no shadow you won't light up Oh yes, my hallelujah 